My man, Cody Berman, what is happening? What's going on, Jesse? Looking forward to this one. I'm super excited. So I don't know if you know this, but I've been listening to your podcast since like 2020. When did you start that podcast, by the way? 2018. So you've been you've been there since almost the beginning. Appreciate it, man. I've been there since I was in corporate America. I was in a cubicle. I'm like, what's this financial freedom thing? I was probably Googling, you know, financial independence. Boom. The financial independence show popped up. And I just remember binging it for a long time and then, uh, you know, got into real estate. And so it's just really cool to like come full circle with the people that have literally helped inspire me along this journey. So I want to say thank you for that. Thank you for putting that content out. Appreciate it, man. And it's actually cool that you've been listening for that long because I know I'm going to share some numbers today. I'm going to share kind of how my entrepreneurial journey has went. And you listened back when I wasn't making that much money and I didn't have these flashy numbers because a lot of times I post something on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it now, or Instagram. And you know, you get all the hater comments like that's BS. Those numbers aren't real. But it's like, listen, I've been sharing my journey publicly for the last six years. Like I have the data to back it up. You can go and listen to this 2018 podcast episode. So you're going to be able to call me out my BS today, Jesse, if I say anything wrong. I love it. It is so funny because I thought I took it from Brian, but Brian might have took it from you when it comes to podcasting and documenting the journey. So that's something that I just started last month. I said, all right, I have amazing guests on, but people are saying, hey, we want to hear more of your story, Jesse, and what you're doing right now. And so, man, I didn't even realize that. Well, I probably came from you as well. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. It's being transparent because a lot of these shows, a lot of these internet influencers, they're just, you know, throwing out numbers, throwing out fluff, but actually aren't doing a lot of things that they say they're doing. So for someone like you being transparent, appreciate that and uh, try to follow in those footsteps. Appreciate it, man. Let's get on with this. <laughs> so let's do it. All right. So financial independent expert, podcast host, Etsy expert. I can go on. Is there anything I missed that you want to highlight that you are just have been crushing it in or currently working on or, you know, doing? I guess the things you missed that I, I'm not going to call myself an expert, but that I dabble in and have made decent money. Real estate is another one. We can talk about that today. And mm -hmm. then just digital products in general. So outside of Etsy, like online courses, memberships, we actually started an agency a little over a year and a half ago where now we're partnering with other people, kind of teaching them the skills that we learned from launching all these courses and memberships and things and a lot of failures, a lot of lessons learned, but now we're kind of helping other people with that. So I guess those are probably the only two things. I think you got everything else, Jesse. I love it. And then you became financially independent at 25. So for the audience listening, a lot of them are entrepreneurs already or aspiring entrepreneurs. What does that mean to you to become financially independent? And then how the heck were you able to do it at 25? <laughs> so it was kind of a combo meal. So I'm going to give some definitions real quick so people can understand what I'm talking about. So there's two main ways to get to financial independence. There's what I like to call the nest egg method. And if you're a part of the FIRE community, financial independence, retire early, you're probably familiar with this method where you save up or you invest 25x your annual expenses. And that's when you become quote unquote financially independent. So if you're spending 40K a year, you save up 25X that, or you invest 25X that in the stock market, a million dollars. Once you get that million dollars invested, you can, in theory, live off that money for the rest of your life. So that's the nest egg method. The next is the cash flow method. This is actually my preferred method. And so this is when you have enough passive or semi-passive cash flow coming in from your investments, whether that be real estate, or maybe it's a small business, or maybe it's digital products, whatever. It's something that's hands-off. You're not trading your time for money with this. It's just paying the monthly bills. So I kind of did a combo meal. I did a little bit of both. So by the time I, or like just before I was about to turn 26 is when I hit the millionaire status when I was 25. So I can still say millionaire at 25, even though it was like 25 and 300 something days. So I hit millionaire status and that was broken up in between uh, between stock market investments and real estate stuff. So at that point, I was already invested in real estate. I think by my the end of my 25th year of life, <laughs> I think I had 11 units. I had a triplex, two triplexes, a duplex and another duplex. Yeah, I think that sounds right. And that portfolio in total, after all expenses, after everything, CapEx reserves, was spitting out about $3,500 per month in profit, like take home. At the time, that just that was covering my expenses. I was only spending like 25, like two grand to $2,500 a month. I know those numbers might sound crazy low to some people, but from 22 to 25, I was just living like a college kid. We can get into that and how I was able to live so cheap. 
But yeah, long story short, the real estate covered my expenses. But on top of that, I also had about, I think it was about four or $500,000 invested in the stock market. So using that same 4% rule, I had about, you know, divide 500,000 by 25. I had about 20 grand in extra spending from the stock market. So I felt pretty solid between the real estate stuff, like the 3,500 ish a month. Of course, it's ups and downs. Some, some months you have a repair, some months you don't. So it's ups and downs on average 3,500 a month, plus the extra 20 grand that I could have taken from the stock market. If I kept my lifestyle similar or even inflated it a little bit by 10 or $20,000 a year, I could have just stopped working and retired right then. So very long-winded answer for you, Jesse, but I hope that kind of clears things up with the listeners, what I meant by financially independent by 25. That was perfect. And I'm a big proponent of living frugal, especially when you're in your 20s. Like, why aren't you? Like, there's no reason to try to flash, <laughs> like, just live frugal, get those assets. So I'm I'm with you and I learned it from your podcast. So 2.5K, uh, 2,500 bucks was kind of like what your baseline lifestyle was at that time. How? It was actually closer to 2000. So right after wow. college, I was spending very, very little in college. I upgraded a little bit out of college, but I was sharing a room in Boston, which many might consider high cost of living city. I mean, a three family or three family, a three unit, not three unit, a three door, <laughs> like a, a three bedroom. Wow. I'm all over the place. In my real estate terms today, a three bedroom apartment in Boston is like 2,500 to 3,500. So our, our apartment was, I think it was 3,000 or 2,900 total. It was three bedrooms. And so I ended up just splitting a room with one of my buddies. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was 2,700 because it was 900 a room. So I just ended up splitting a room with one of my buddies. Our beds were so close that I could have just rolled over and touched him at night. So it wasn't the most ideal situation, but I was, I was paying 450 bucks a month for housing. For a car, I was still driving the same paid off car, didn't have a car payment. I had a pretty good job right out of college. And I was making good money with entrepreneurship after that, but I never upgraded the car. I'm actually still driving that car to this day. So paid off, didn't have a car payment. It was just like insurance and gas. For food stuff, I was pretty reasonable. And I just had like a grocery list every week. And I went out and bought those groceries. If and when I did go out to eat, I would just get something cheap. I wouldn't really get too many drinks. I'd pregame hard. So I didn't have to get a lot of drinks out. And so, I mean, that was pretty much it, man. It was like the housing was 450. The car was maybe... 300 to 400 a month, depending on the month, food and entertainment and travel kind of filled up the rest of that $2,000 bucket and miscellaneous stuff. And that was it. But honestly, getting those big two, right, the housing and transportation, I always say, if you can get those two, right, you can spend lavishly in other categories. Like if you can get rid of that $2,000 a month housing payment and that $900 a month lease car payment and just get a beater, get a used car, downgrade or house hack or whatever you eliminate those two what was that twenty nine hundred dollars a month i think i just looked at those stats today actually those are like average stats and i don't remember exactly what city but twenty nine hundred dollars a month between those two things you get that to zero or even to a thousand you can spend an extra fifteen hundred dollars a month on travel or on going out with your friends to events to concerts to restaurants it's like focus all your energy on getting those two big ones right. And then you have just so much more autonomy. So that's how I was able to do it. And honestly, it didn't feel like deprivation to me. I was still going out to the bars. I was mm. still going out to restaurants. It was just a little bit more intentional. I wasn't just blowing everything that was coming in. I love that. Yeah. It's so important to be intentional, especially if you're trying to live frugal and stack up that cash to invest in something like real estate. I guess my question is, did you ever have lifestyle creep start? Yes. So lifestyle creep, finally started in 2022 so 2022 is when i turned 26 and that's when that's when the creep started to happen yeah, once no, i hit no. that milestone <laughs> once i hit that milestone at 25 i hit millionaire status i was like i'm financially independent by multiple standards by cash flow method not quite nest egg method but i had like 20 grand a month coming in with you know the 25x four percent rule type of thing 26 is when i started to inflate my lifestyle a little bit not crazy I was still house hacking. I'm actually still house hacking to this day, still driving a paid off car. Where I did start to spend more though was on experiences. So we started to travel a lot more. When we travel, we'd stay in a nicer place, not just the cheapest Airbnb possible. When we travel, we'd go out to eat a lot more and not just at the local spot that was you know, $5 for a meal. We'll actually go and try out nice restaurants and we'll eat the local cuisine and go to more events and go to more concerts. So my spending definitely went up in like the experience category. But honestly, the Housing and transportation, those have still remained static all these years. And I'm 28 now to give people some reference. That's amazing. How'd you stay somewhat level with travel? 
I feel like that's the one part of me where I'm like, all right, I got a budget. And then it's always five X the budget whenever I go travel. <laughs> what's some travel? What's some travel hacks? Travel hacks is credit cards. So I used to be big into travel hacking and credit card rewards. I have a spreadsheet with 32 credit cards on it. Like that's how crazy I used to be about this stuff. I used to open cards, hit the sign up bonus, close it. I even got into like credit card churning a little bit where you're like manufacturing the spend and you're buying gift cards on them to hit them. It was crazy, man. Like it wasn't worth it. I don't do that anymore, but I still do just have a couple of credit cards that I keep in rotation. My monthly expenses are a lot higher. And now I have business expenses since I'm running multiple businesses and I just get a ton of points and I use those points to book travel. So whether it's flights or even staying at Airbnbs or hotels, a lot of times, like I don't remember the last time I paid full price for a flight. And the last time we stayed in Airbnb, we actually used credit from like a Capital One Venture card to get an Airbnb gift card and use that toward the stay. So there's a lot of different travel hacks. Once, if you're listening to this and you're not responsible with credit cards and you have a bunch of credit card debt and you're not paying it every month, please don't try the strategy. But I'm guessing you, you got a smart audience. We're all about growth here. You guys know how to handle credit. You guys aren't hopefully racking up a huge tab and letting the 25% interest just hit you over the head month over month over month. If you can figure out the credit card game, like, man, it's a total unlock. And it doesn't have to be as crazy as 32 credit cards on a spreadsheet with the open and closed dates and when to call the bank and all this stuff. But honestly, just get like two or three cards and use them for your everyday expenses instead of a debit card or instead of some crappy Amazon card or Apple card that I see a lot of people use. <laughs> and uh, you can get your travel paid for. Again, this is for those who are interested in travel. And it adds up really fast. And if you get, you know, Twenty to thirty thousand dollars on like a Chase card, or a or twenty to thirty thousand dollars in spend on a Chase card, or a Capital One Venture, or any of these other flexible spending cards. That's enough for you to go on a little vacation. That's enough to cover the flight. So, yeah, it was a total unlock for me. Still do it to this day. Not quite as crazy as before, but that's how I do travel efficiently. Even though I do want to say this, Jesse, I do spend way more on travel than I did a couple years ago. Like we're <laughs> traveling all the time. We're yeah. staying in nice places. Travel is my biggest expense category by far buy like a landslide. So I don't want to pretend that I'm going on these exotic trips and spending like a thousand dollars total on a four week trip, but I am doing some things to cut down on the spend a little bit. I think that's so important for the audience to realize too. Like people say, Jesse, how are you able to travel all the time and hit financial independence at an early age? Guys, I'm also driving the same car that's been paid off for years. It's the first car I ever bought. Like I still have it. And so it's something that I spend my money, it sounds like you do too, on the things that actually matter to us, matter to me, which is travel is a big one. So as we kind of shift topics a little bit, our audience is all about striving to hit financial independence, right? And then in order to do that for me was through real estate. It was through house hacking and then co-living. For you, I believe a big proponent for you was through digital products, Etsy, et cetera. So I'd love for you to do kind of like a, a, a tactical you know, a step by step almost, if you can, about, you know, a way to, to hit financial freedom through maybe digital products, because this is something that we haven't talked about on our podcast at all. For sure. Yeah. Digital products is actually where I make most of my money now. So a lot of people will see me and think I'm a real estate guy because I come on podcasts and talk about real estate because people ask me to and I post about it on Twitter or X and Instagram or whatever. But I actually make probably 80 to 90 percent of my income on digital stuff. So in terms of Etsy and printables, how I kind of got started with this whole journey, I used to be like the side hustle guy. That was my shtick back in 2018. If you listen to the, my podcast back then, you would have known that I was doing 20 different things at once. And honestly, it was a big mistake. Now I'm a much bigger proponent of do a couple of things right than try to do 20 things at the same time, mediocre. So I was just trying all Guilty. these side hustles. Yes. Everyone's guilty. Everyone who gets into this space just tries to take on too much at once. And then they're doing 20 things. Okay. Not maybe three or four things really, really well. So for me, I was trying a million side hustles. I got introduced to this side hustle by my friend, Julie. And she was like, Hey, I'm selling these things called printables on Etsy. I'd never been on Etsy before. I didn't know what a printable was, but she's like, I spent 50 hours putting together my shop and I made $6,000. And she's like, I'm still getting sales daily, even though I'm not working on this anymore, because she was working for Amazon and she was having a kid and she was she was just not working on it anymore, but it was still bringing in money. None of my things were really doing that. All of the things that I was doing, it was like freelance writing. It was editing podcasts, editing video, uh, managing affiliate programs, email copywriting. It was all this stuff where I had to trade my time for money. 
if I didn't do the thing, I wasn't getting a paycheck. So this idea of like passive income, this was the first time I was like, okay, this seems like something where I put in the work once or I put in the money once or I put in the energy once, and then I can kind of reap the benefits of that work for years and years to come. So I tried my hand at it. Honestly, it was terrible. I, the, my products were so bad. Like the first 20, nobody was doing them. Nobody was clicking them. Nobody was buying them. I didn't know what I didn't know. Give me, give me a little, give me a little sample of some of the products. <laughs> Oh my God, you're going to die. So the first one I ever created <laughs> was a 21st birthday party drinking game. Now, some people listening might be like, oh, that sounds oh, like no. a good idea. <laughs> what 21-year-old is going on Etsy to look for a game to drink? They're just going to get shit-faced. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wow, that's they're a not, point. <laughs> they're not going on Etsy to go and find a game to make it more fun. Like They're just going to get drunk. They're excited. They're at the bar. So that was a terrible product. I didn't do any keyword research, no SEO. And like that's what I'm all about now is doing the research, getting the data up front, and then making data-driven decisions. I didn't do any of that for my first 20 or so products. But I finally caught wind of keyword research and SEO. So I figured out what products might be successful. I created a bunch of seasonal products for Valentine's Day, actually. My birthday is on Valentine's Day. So I was traveling that week, Lake Tahoe. I'm snowboarding with a bunch of people in the side hustle, financial independent space. Have my phone on volume because I'm expecting a call and my phone's just blowing up with the cha-ching sound, which is the sound of making a sale on Etsy. So I go into the lodge for lunch and I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, oh my God, I've made $100 today from these digital products. And this is like the first time passive income was real. I'd made a little bit from affiliate marketing through my blog and podcast, but this is the first time where I'd like created something and people were buying it when I wasn't working on it. It was awesome. And so by the end of that week, I'd made over $700. This is way earlier in my journey. And that was a lot of money to me. Like I was writing blog posts for friggin' 50 bucks. I'm making $700 while I'm not working the whole week skiing at Lake Tahoe. So after that, it was like, I went all in on digital products and that's the rest is kind of history. I Really went hard on the seasonal products you? route. Let's see. 2019, I was 23. And or, yeah, did you go from high school to college or you went from high school to freelance stuff? No, I went from high school to college. So I was in college from age 18 to 21 or 22. I think I was 21 when I graduated college. And then I lived in Australia for six months. Then I got a corporate banking job for seven months quit that job. And then I went full entrepreneur. So I had a, I had a corporate job for a long seven months. And then I went full blown entrepreneur. I love it. Okay. So you started <laughs> making this passive income through Etsy, the digital pro digital products. And then what happened? So it just kept taking off, kept doing better and better. So I kind of kept following that seasonal strategy. So where I had made a bunch of products for Valentine's Day specifically, I had like love coupons and these like little notes that you could give your significant other and just Valentine's Day cards that you could customize and put your spouse's or girlfriend or boyfriend's face in it, all this stuff, all this like seasonal stuff. But I did that for a whole year. So I created stuff like St. Patrick's Day stuff for March and Super Bowl stuff for the Super Bowl that was right around that same time. And Easter stuff in April and then graduation stuff in May and Mother's Day and Father's Day and all these things. I just went through the entire year. And by the end of that year, I just had this whole product suite of digital products, of seasonal products, so that the next year, so like 2019, the next year in 2020, guess what happens? All of those seasonal products keep selling with the same season. So like the stuff that I created back in 2019 for Valentine's Day sold in 2024 for Valentine's Day. Five years later, the same freaking product. So it's been pretty That's amazing. amazing. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah. So cool. So cool. So like, again, it's once you put in the work and honestly, what actually really shifted this for me was the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Cause I used to always mm. think that quote unquote, rich people were just people who made a lot of money per hour, doctors, lawyers, they're, you know, someone's like, Oh, they make $500 an hour. They're rich until I realized the richest people don't trade their time for money at all. The richest people buy assets or build assets and then get cash flow from those assets. They're not trading their time for money like a lawyer or a doctor or another high power job. Once I made that transition, once that light switch flipped in my head, I'm like, okay, I should be focusing all of my time, energy, and resources on either building or buying assets that are going to produce cash flow for me later on. So kept going with the digital products. I was investing in real estate. The digital products actually led to kind of mentorship and coaching and people just asking me about that because your face just lit up when I was telling you about the seasonal products and how cool it was. 
So naturally, people are asking me, they're asking Julie. And after enough one-on-one calls, one-on-one Zoom calls, teaching people how to do this, we're like, okay, we need to make, we need to do something about this. So we ended up building like a course and a membership to just make it way easier to facilitate the information. So we didn't have to sit on, you know, two hour long one-on-one Zoom calls. That blew up way bigger than we could have ever imagined. At this point now, we've had 20,000 students go through that course. We've had some people quit their jobs. We've had people featured That's in Business amazing. Insider and CNBC and The Sun. And it's been crazy, dude. Like the fact that this all started from a little side hustle idea back in 2019 to now having over 20,000 students, having some of these students reach levels beyond what we ever thought was possible on Etsy. And yeah, man, it's just, it's been a wild ride. Super rewarding though. Super rewarding. I wouldn't change anything if I, if I had to. That's amazing. And I want my audience to go check you out. And if it's a good fit, like dive into that course on this podcast. Is there anything, if someone's just starting out and a little, you know, a couple little secrets, little tips on how to actually get started, what would you say? Keyword research and SEO are the most important things. Do not just create something because you think it's going to be popular. Actually use the data, see what people are searching for. So for Etsy specifically, there's a tool. This is kind of a little golden nugget. It's called E-Rank. There's another one called Everbee. And you can go and just type in different product ideas and you can see how many people are searching for them, what the competition's like, how seasonal they are, and a bunch of other data. So you can actually use that to inform the products that you're going to create so you don't waste a bunch of time, like I did at the beginning of my journey, creating all these products that people didn't want. So that's huge. Another one is kind of like YouTube has a thumbnail. If the thumbnail's not good, nobody's clicking. It's the same thing with a digital product. It's called a listing image or just like a main image, hero image, whatever you want to call it. If that thing isn't good, if that thing doesn't entice people to click, you're not going to make a sale. Even if you have the best product ever, you can't have an ugly book cover because a book is judged by its cover. So you have to have something nice for people to look at that they want to click in and learn more about and buy it. So that's super important. It's just like a book, just like a YouTube thumbnail, same thing with digital products and that main listing image. Make sure that thing is friggin' amazing and it's super attention grabbing and it tells people exactly what they're going to get. Those are probably my two biggest pieces of advice that people miss when they get started out. And then are you looking at like a lower ticket item? Are you looking at things that cost under a certain amount? Like walk me through just a little bit about the research that goes into finding what product would be good. It's a great question. So some people play the volume game. Some people play the value game. So printables, digital products can range anywhere from a couple of bucks to a hundred dollars on Etsy. That's probably the highest tiered stuff you'd get. Probably in the wedding niche, you'd sell like a wedding package where it's all the place cards and it's all the, just all the stationery you need for a wedding. So for me, I'll try to look for something in like the five to $10 per unit range, which might sound really low, but it's a volume game. There's a hundred million buyers on Etsy. So if you can even get a very small percentage, let's say there's 10,000 people every month searching for a specific product and you can capture 0.5% of the market share. Oh God, am I about to do public math, Jesse? I think that's 50 <laughs> sales like, per month. <laughs> I, I think that's 50 sales per month. I might be doing that wrong. I think that's 50 though. And at five or 10 bucks a pop, that's like 250 or $500 in potentially passive income. Because again, these things are selling over and over and over again without you doing additional work. Once you get the product listed on these platforms like Etsy, it's a digital file. So literally you upload it into your shop. Someone buys it. Etsy delivers the vial to them. That's it. You don't have to communicate with them unless they have a problem, which is 5% or less of buyers. That's why I like to say this is all it's 95% passive income because it's like one in 20 people that will send me a message like, hey, I can't figure out how to download or hey, they'll have a specific question about a product or whatever, but mostly passive income. So yeah, it's a it's a great side hustle. It's honestly one of the most passive side hustles I've ever had to this day. And I've tried 30 plus. So is there other platforms or is Etsy like the go to platform for you because you kind of figured out how it works? So I've expanded beyond Etsy. For beginners, I like to say Etsy is the go-to platform. The reason for that is you can be successful on Etsy without an audience. So if you're selling on Shopify or you're selling on your own website with a plugin like WooCommerce, you're going to have to drum up the traffic. So you better have a social media following or you better know how to work ads or you better understand SEO. With Etsy though, as long as you understand the keyword research and SEO behind your products, again, they have 100 million buyers on the platform. Etsy is just going to send you traffic if the thing that you created aligns with what the people are searching for. It's kind of like, it could be a similar question. 
is it worth selling on Amazon or should you sell on your own website? It's like, well, it depends. You're going to get a lot of traffic on Amazon. They'll take a cut, but they'll bring traffic to you. But if you don't need Amazon, if you're already a huge influencer, you have your own product, maybe you're a fitness influencer and you have a supplement line, maybe you don't need to sell through Amazon. Maybe you just sell through your own website. You'll have higher margins, but you're responsible for driving all that traffic. It's kind of the same thing with Etsy versus Shopify or a WooCommerce plugin or something similar. Mm -hmm. What's been the most profitable um, product that you've ever put out? Oh, you're going to ask me that question, Jesse? Gonna make me spill my secret sauce. <laughs> All right, I'll oh, share yeah, one of them. That's, no, no, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'll share one of them. I'll share one of them that's done really, really uh, well. Right. So one of those original products actually from that first ski trip, the Lake Tahoe was these love coupons. So it was like, I think it was eight or 10 on the page. You, you'd you buy them, you'd cut them out at your house, you'd give them to your significant other. It's just like breakfast in bed, you know, dinner out, movie night or whatever. These... It's literally a piece of paper. This piece of paper has made just, just this one product. And I have like 200 products in my shop. This piece of paper has made me over $4,000. And it took me two hours to create. It's wild. <laughs> it's wild, dude. So Obviously, you, not all of them work out like that. You yourself? But yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of times I'm using... A lot of times I'll have an idea. And then I'll lean on a keyword research tool to figure out if it's going to be a viable product. And then if the if the data says, yes, Cody, go for it, then I'll go for it. So yeah, a lot of times I'll generate the ideas. Sometimes, I mean, now I'll use AI to generate ideas and then I'll bring that data over to a keyword research tool and see what's good. So yeah, I, again, always lean on the data. Don't just like think of an idea and create something unless you're first to market. So there, I'm giving a lot of caveats here. There, there are exceptions where you're not gonna have the data. But for example, we had someone in our community when COVID hit, a lot of these things didn't have traffic before, but things like, wash your hand signs, must stay six feet away signs. Every sign that you could think of, any piece of stationery related to COVID, think about how much volume there was on Etsy for small business owners and people buying that stuff. But there was no keyword research telling you, like if you looked back a previous year, you're not gonna say, wow, six feet away signs, those things are blowing up. No, you, you just have, kind of have to have the intuition and know that these things might be popular. So we had a couple of people who just absolutely killed it with those types of products but you wouldn't have been able to do that with keyword research. So there are some exceptions. If you know that a trend is going to be popular, if you have a really strong conviction, go for it. But usually creating mm. from gut feeling isn't the best strategy. I like to lean on the data. And then how many products to make a good, you know, I don't know how much per month, but to make a good income, let's say at least 5k per month, how many products typically do you need to have? Or do you kind of just find one that hits and ride that one? It's a numbers game. But with that being said, usually we find the sweet spot to be 100 plus products because it's kind of the Pareto principle where 20% or less of your products are going to be bringing in the lion's share of the revenue. So I have products that I listed in my shop, even in the last year that just haven't sold at all. For whatever reason, the customer didn't like it. Maybe I had a design error. Maybe my title was wrong. Maybe I just didn't exactly cr didn't create the exact thing that someone was looking for no big deal. I'll have one or two out of 20 products that I create just absolutely kill it. So it's totally a numbers game. We usually see that dial, like maybe the multi thousand per month mark happen after around a hundred products or so. Man, five star rating and review. We're getting Cody to spill some secrets on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Cody, what's the most you've ever made in a month? Oof. All right. You're asking the deep questions, Jesse. So on, I had man. one month where everything just went right. I, the courses, the memberships, the digital products were killing it. We had a decent month with podcast stuff. We had flipped a house. That's the big one that makes this number really impressive. Total mm. number for the month was 417K. 417K for one month? Yeah. That's podcast top one. Podcast is over. <laughs> <My job>. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's amazing. So, man, <laughs> okay. I don't know where to go from there. That's top line. So that was from that's the, what you're asking, right? That's top line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So over $400,000. <laughs> that's amazing. So when it comes down to the real estate game for you, actually, let me ask you this. The blueprint to becoming, let's just not even say a millionaire, but financially free, let's say 10K uh, in passive or semi-passive income. And that could be rental properties, Etsy, digital products, et cetera. What do you think is kind of like the best blueprint 
that you've seen work right now to get to that 10K of semi-passive or passive income? This is going to sound basic, but maximize the gap between your income and your expenses and invest the difference. Invest everything in that gap. And I'm not going to lean hard. I know you probably wanted a more direct answer to the question like, do this real estate strategy or invest in these types of stocks. I don't think it matters what you're investing in if you can get a massive savings rate. If you can be saving, these numbers are going to sound astronomical, but this is what it took for me to reach millionaire status and financial freedom at 25. If you can save like 80% of your income, 90% of your income, again, those numbers might sound bonkers. But if you can do that, it really doesn't matter what you're investing in so much as the amount of money that you're able to save on a month to month basis, whether you're getting 15% returns in real estate or 12% in the stock market or 20% in small business, like those numbers do matter over time. Yes. And percentages, compound interest, if you run a compound interest calculator and you do like 7% versus 10% versus 15%, the numbers are wild over like a 40 year span. But in the short term, if you're looking to hit financial independence in the next five to 10 years, seriously focus on getting those expenses down as low as possible. So Jesse talked about, I talked about driving a paid off car. I'm still house hacking to this day, even though my net worth is way higher than it was when I started this journey. And I'm still frugal in some areas of my life. I'm just spending lavishly in the parts of my life that excite me, like the experiences and the travel and the going out to eat and going to events and stuff like that. But yeah, man, it's, it's really just maximizing that gap between your income and expenses investing the difference and no matter what you invest in unless it's unless it's a horrible investment that's what i'll say unless you're investing in penny stocks and the and stonks and these like <laughs> meme coins and cryptocurrencies that you expect to go to the moon then maybe you won't hit it <laughs> you won't reach financial freedom because one of those things is likely to tank but if you're investing in the tried and true stuff index funds real estate no matter what types you're probably going to do pretty well and you'll be able to hit financial independence in honestly, less than a decade, if you can get that savings rate really high. I love that answer. And I was on that same path. Uh, I don't know if I was quite at 80%, but my baseline salary for my sales job was $42,000 when I started. I kept that same. I said, okay, from like the time I'm working corporate until I quit, I'm living as if I'm making only 42K. At the last year, I made up to like almost $200,000 through my, uh, my sales job, but I saved everything to then get into real estate. So, so true. It doesn't matter really what vehicle is this that you actually are saving and investing it in something that will then produce, you know, passive income. I love that. What, what, what drives you? What keeps you going, man? Cause you've already hit, you know, a lot of, you know, financial goals and you live a nice life. You're able to travel. What, what keeps you going? That's a great question. And when I get asked very often, they're like, don't you have enough money? What are you doing this for? Honestly, at this point, Shout out to Alex Hermosi. He has the podcast, The Game. It's a game at this point. It's it's a game, man. It's like once you get to this level of business, people are like, well, isn't that enough? It's like, well, it's not the money at this point. It's becoming a better businessman. It's understanding marketing better. It's understanding funnels better. It's understanding products better. That stuff is fun to me. It's like once you hit, let's say you're a runner. And once you hit like some certain mile pace, let's say you hit a six minute mile, are you just going to be happy with staying in that six minute mile for the rest of your life? Like probably not. Wouldn't you rather get like 555 and 550 and 545? Like hell yeah. So it's the same thing with business. Like, of course I'm happy with where I'm at in business, but do I want to get to the next level? Yes. Cause it feels good and I'm learning and I'm growing and humans weren't meant to just be static and be complacent and not grow and not learn and not do new stuff. So that's, that's what keeps me going, man. It's just like the excitement of business and learning new things. It's, it's not the money anymore. It's the game. I love that. And yeah, I, I didn't realize that until like a year and a half ago because I did the whole hit financial independence, hit financial freedom, go travel. And then I'm like, all right, now I'm actually kind of bored <laughs> and I don't feel like I have a purpose. I kind of lost my identity. I was this corporate sales guy. At first it was basketball, then it was corporate sales. And then I'm like, now what? And so you're, you're totally right. It becomes a game and then also becomes fulfilling because you get to actually do the things that give you energy. Like for me, I've now created the growth house community. I have these growth houses. And so, yeah, this is so true. I think people think it ends once you hit financial independence or financial freedom, but that's just really when life gets exciting and you get to actually play to win instead of play not to lose. I love that. Yeah. Financial freedom is the beginning, man. It's the beginning of figuring out what you want to do with your day. It's a, it's honestly overwhelming and scary because a lot of the things that people don't do, they say, oh, once I retire, I'll do that. Once I have this amount of money, I'll do that. But once you reach that, if you're not already doing it when you're on the path, 
you're very unlikely to do that once you hit the number. Like if you want to learn Spanish and you're not learning Spanish while you're in your job or while you're going after financial freedom, you're probably not going to start learning Spanish the second you reach financial freedom. If you want to learn guitar, if you want to get better at basketball, if you want to get faster, if you want to get in better shape and you aren't doing those things while you're on the path to financial independence or whatever your goal might be, it's highly unlikely that you're going to just randomly start doing all those things the second you hit some arbitrary milestone that you set for yourself. So yeah, I'm getting on my mm. soapbox here, but I feel really strongly about now, that. Also, I don't know if you just said this, but also it could be happiness. People are like, I'll actually be less stressed and more happy once I you know, hit this number. And it's like furthest from the truth. You hit the number and this is like, all right, still got to wake up tomorrow. Still the like what's next? And I think it's so true that people like people need these big goals to go after or they kind of lose, you know, purpose of life. Like what else is there besides going and like growing? And for me, it's becoming the best version of me. Like you, you said, becoming a better business person, learning more about these tactics, funnels, which I need a lot of help with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's um, there's a lot of people today that have a lot of, you know, excuses and maybe some victim mentality. But what do you think keeps people? I won't even say broke in today's world. But what do you think keeps people back from really becoming the entrepreneur that they can be? You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people get stuck. What do you think would help them push forward? Okay. So this is an entrepreneur specific question, or is this a yeah. average Let's person going after financial for... freedom? Okay. What's well, specifically for entrepreneurs? I like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think many entrepreneurs, one, don't take big enough risks. They mm. are scared to outsource, which I was very scared to outsource because they think, and I know a lot of people are going to resonate with me on this. I can't hire this out because I know how to do this best. Nobody is Stop as good talking. as me Stop at this. Stop talking directly <laughs> to me, man. Stop talking yeah. to me. <laughs> I can't hire out my podcast editing. I can't hire out my coaching because I'm the best. I know exactly how I want it done. Nobody else is going to do it as good as me. So I'm just going to keep on doing it myself. That is the biggest mistake you will make in entrepreneurship. Causing yourself to become a bottleneck for growth is, I just see so many entrepreneurs shoot themselves in the foot and they can't get past whatever revenue mark they want to reach because they're scared to hire for help. And I always like to think of it like if you're just thinking on a strictly hours basis, you're one person working, let's call it 40 hours a week. That's one person with 40 hours a week going towards their goal. You're one person and you hire three people. Now you have four people working 40 hours a week. You have 160 hours per week going toward that same goal. Who do you think is going to win? It's the person with the three people hired under them with 160 hours going towards that goal. You just keep scaling this out and out and out. And once you have a team of 10 people under you working 40 hours, you have you know 440 hours going toward that goal where the entrepreneur who's still stuck thinking that they're the best and they can do everything by themselves, they have a one eleventh of the, the manpower of the firepower that you have in your business. You are going to blow them out of the water. So if your goal is growth, if your goal is revenue, I get it. If you want to be a one man or one woman show, that's totally cool totally fine. You can do that. But if your goal is like growth, which is what your podcast is all about, then you need to learn how to hire and get over that hurdle of thinking that you're the best and you're the only one who can do stuff. And again, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I struggled with this a ton in my first couple of years. I was such a type A perfectionist. When someone would do something, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe they didn't edit that out of the podcast. Or I can't believe they left that in that blog post. Or I'm like, that YouTube thumbnail sucks. But you can train people. They get better. And mm. over time, it's you can replace yourself. Gosh, I got an example right now, man. I finally found someone that was great for posting content for YouTube, for doing shorts. They were doing everything. And I was just like, like every time they did something a little bit wrong, I didn't have the leadership skills to be like, all right, let me help train you. I was like, this is terrible. <laughs> Redo that one <laughs> real. And then they end up leaving me. And I'm like, why would they leave me? And I didn't take a step back and be like, well, you had zero leadership <laughs> when it came to managing you know, that, that group of people that was helping you. And so a hundred percent, man, it took me a long time to even get there. So now I'm relooking like, Oh shoot. Now I got to find someone else that to do all that editing and stuff like that. What do you think is the first thing that people should uh, look to outsource? Totally depends on your business. Honestly, the first thing, mm -hmm. no, this is my answer. It doesn't depend on the business. The thing that you hate doing is the first thing you should outsource. <laughs> get rid of the, the things that are terrible that make you like, that make you want to pull your hair out. And you're like, I hate doing, I hate the show notes of my podcast. Like I love talking to people. The show notes suck. Build an SOP, a standard operating procedure, get a VA and get those show notes taken care mm -hmm. of. Get all the stuff off your plate that you don't want to deal with. So then you can just focus all of your time and energy, your deep work on the stuff that matters, the stuff that fires you up. That's my answer. Hire out the stuff that you hate doing. I love that answer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 
we're coming to the near end of the show, but here's the thing. I'm going to take some personal time to ask you some questions that I want to know. So All we're right. going back to the podcast. <laughs> You've been doing the podcast game for a minute. What's like, um, if you're open to sharing, what's like the downloads that you guys are at now and like how many monthly downloads? Because I'm trying to put this in perspective for me as I'm setting my goals. We've launched this podcast just six months ago. And so I'm trying to figure out, all right, what can I work on? How do I prove? But also what are some milestones that I should try to strive to achieve? So we're a weekly podcast. So we put out four to five episodes per month, depending on the month, because some months have more Wednesdays than others. But we average between 30 and 40,000 downloads a month, depending on the guests, depending on promotion, depending on the episode titles and what people are interested in. But yeah, that's a pretty typical month is somewhere between 30 and 40,000. We haven't eclipsed 40,000 yet. But again, we're also only doing four or five episodes every single month. So the average episode will probably get somewhere between five to 7,000 downloads. And then, you know, you can do the math five times four is only 20,000. You're like, where do the rest of the downloads come from? It's the backlog. So people are going back and listening to old stuff too. So that kind of makes up the rest of the 30 to 40,000. And then what's your, cause it's both of you. I forget your, uh, your host's name. It's you and Justin, Justin. That's right. And so for you guys, what's the main reason why you started the podcast and then what is it used for now? Main reason we started it was there was really at the time in 2018, there was no young people. When I started the podcast, I was 22. I had just graduated college and there was really no young people on the path to Phi showing you along. Like I basically started from zero net worth when I started the podcast or maybe it was a little bit after. So maybe I had like 50 or 75 grand total net worth, but now it's like a hundred X that a hundred, a um, hundred X that. And I've been sharing the journey the whole way. So honestly, that's why we started. It was like, we just wanted to show other people that this was possible. I think Justin's net worth, he's a couple of years older than me, but I think it was like 230,000 or something like that. And now we both hit financial independence. We both hit millionaire, multimillionaire status. It's been pretty cool. So that was the reason why we started it. And the reason why we keep going is just, we get such awesome feedback, man. Like we'll get an email, we'll get a response on Twitter. We'll get a message on Instagram people quitting their jobs, people getting raises, people starting side hustles, people starting businesses, people forming partnerships. It's just, it's super rewarding. I, I absolutely love it. Those messages fire me up. And personally, like why I'm selfishly still loving the podcast is I have a, I have the chance to talk to so many cool people. I'm sure having this podcast has just opened so many more doors and more connections to people that you might've not had the chance to talk with. Imagine you hit someone up, like a really high caliber person. And you're like, Yo, can I pick your brain for an hour? Just let's have a phone call, one on one. They're gonna be like, hell no. They're no, they're not gonna say hell no. They're not gonna answer you. But you have a platform, you have a podcast, it looks legit, you're making reels, like you got a YouTube channel and all this stuff. All of a sudden they're like, Oh, of course I'll talk to you one on one for an hour, just because the setting is different and people are gonna be able to listen to it. It's the same thing. You could ask them the same questions you would on the phone call, but having a platform like like this gives me more access selfishly. So I get to ask questions to some high caliber people high caliber people that I might not have the chance to talk to otherwise. So good for people starting a podcast. What are like two or three tips that you have that you're like, man, these people do it wrong every single time when they're starting out. I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tip number one is consistency. Don't be the person who puts up one podcast and then three weeks later, you put on another one. And then two days after that, you put another one. And then six months after that, a lot of people will wait. If they have a favorite show, they know when it's coming out. So a lot of people that have been listening to our show for years, they know our show comes out on Wednesday. I know like Tim Ferriss listeners, they know when his podcasts come out. There, people are waiting for that. So if you can kind of build that rhythm, that anticipation, you're going to get way more consistent downloads over time. So pick a release schedule. Could be every day. Could be like Brian does, which is insane. Could be two times a week. Could be weekly. Could be bi-weekly. Could be monthly. But just make sure- Four, four times a week. <laughs> Four times a week. But after you yeah. pick that cadence, stick with it. Stay. Don't be flaky because mm. your audience is going to be like, what the heck? Like, I've been waiting for this podcast episode on Friday. You know what? On to the next one. I'm going to go listen to a different podcast because I was waiting. I was waiting on Jesse, but it didn't deliver today. So that's one. And then two is if you want to make this a business is have calls to action early. Calls to action doesn't have to be ads. It doesn't have to be sponsorships. It doesn't have to be whatever. It could just be a call to action. Like, Hey guys, leave a review. Hey guys, do this. If you can train your audience to take action based on what you say, then you're going to be able to monetize and build a relationship with that audience. I don't want to say monetize. It sounds slimy, but you're going to be able to build a relationship with that audience and help them in different ways later on. So if you 
sell some coaching or consulting or some course that could really help them. Like, let's say they're really interested in Airbnbs and you have this Airbnb podcast. Maybe they want to pay you for one-on-one coaching, but you don't have a mechanism for that. And you haven't trained them to like click or go over to the website or whatever. So doing that early on, I see a lot of people where they'll have a podcast for like an entire year or two years. And then all of a sudden they'll just start hitting their audience with ads or all of a sudden they'll be like, Hey, I got this course. You want to come buy my course? And it just comes off as slimy because the audience isn't used to it. So if you can kind of build that in from the very beginning, again, if you want to monetize your podcast, which I'm I'm guessing anyone who's listening to this, anyone who's part of the, the growth gang, <laughs> they're probably someone who wants to monetize, not just have a hobby podcast. That's about sci-fi and murder mysteries. Um, if, if you're doing this podcast for any type of business reason, build in those calls to action early and get the audience acclimated with buying and clicking and just being in your ecosystem. Hmm. How'd you learn how to like set your podcast up correctly? Like, was there a podcast coach or a community that you joined? No, I've gone to some podcast conferences and I went to some virtual conferences too. But at the very beginning, 2018, it was a lot of seeing what the best podcasts were on the market. And we honestly just take bits Mm -hmm. and pieces from those podcasts. It's like, why reinvent the wheel? These podcasts are getting millions of downloads. Mm -hmm. This is how they're structured. Here's how they're formatted. Let's follow something similar. So there's a couple of things. I don't even remember who, who we took these out of, but like we do a, a clip of the, at the beginning, which is very popular. You do a clip from the middle of the episode. It's like very enticing. It's like a sound bite, 10 to 30 seconds. Usually you have the guest saying something awesome. Like maybe you're going to use my monthly revenue thing. I don't know if you do that or if you're going to use that for this episode, but yeah, it, it hooks people in. So I was like, okay, let's do that. The big podcasts are doing that. It seems like a great way to grab a listener with that sound bite. So we took it and we added it to our podcast. Other podcasts have like an intro describing the podcast with some music behind it. So what do we do? We add an intro with some music behind it. Other podcasts have outros with calls to action and tells them to go to a website or to download some freebie or leave a review or whatever. So what do we do? We did that. So honestly, a lot of it was copycatting pieces from different podcasts, splicing them all together with what we liked and what we didn't like. And that's how our show came to be. I feel a lot better than uh, for copying your guys' intro and also Brian Lewis. So it makes me feel good. Perfect. <laughs> Dude, copy all you want. Don't reinvent the wheel. Oh, man. I love it. It is it's so true. It's so true. You'll like this one as we wrap up. Um, just talking about consistency for the podcast. So what I did, because I'm like, I'm pretty consistent, but I need to have like a consequence if I don't hit it. So for us, it's Monday and Wednesday. We have guests, right? And then Tuesday and Friday, I basically document my journey. So it's a solo episode. And so my my thing is that all my Instagram followers know that if I don't post an episode that day by 3 p.m., they DM me and I have to send them 150 bucks. Oh, my so God. So it's a little <laughs> bit extra accountability. I'm like, I can't miss too many of these. Or it, gets, it gets expensive. <laughs> Let's hope you don't get like 5 million followers and more people find out about this. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's the first person. It's the first person. Not okay, like okay, okay. <laughs> that would be nuts. That's smart. That would be nuts. Cody, um, our community, Growth House community, is a community of go-givers, right? So we're here trying to provide value to the people that come on our show because you don't have to be here, man. I appreciate you. You know, Obviously, we're going to develop a deeper friendship, but this is still taking an hour out of your day. So I just want to say thank you for that. And what we want to do is provide you some type of value. So if someone reaches out to you, they're not going to say, can I pick your brain? If they do, let me know. I'm going to talk to them. (laughs) So when people reach out, how can they provide Cody some value? Before I answer this, you said go-givers. Are you a fan of that book? I love that book. Love that book. Dude, that changed my life. We can talk about that in another podcast, but... Honestly, giving first with wait, 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 no wait, wait, expectation. Wait. You heard it. You hear it. You heard it here first. Cody said there's gonna be a part two, baby. Let's go. <laughs> we could talk about giving, but dude, it's changed my life. Like giving without expectation, it just comes back tenfold, mm. man. It's crazy. Okay, but to answer your question directly, you said the best way people can reach out to me or types of people I want to connect with. What was the exact question you asked? Yeah, how do people reach out to you, and when they do, what kind of value can they give you? Whether it's like, hey, subscribe to a YouTube channel, follow the podcast, whatever it is, what can people say when they reach out to you? I mean, honestly, if you guys just go and check out my podcast, much appreciated. I don't need much in return from you guys. And maybe give me a follow on Instagram at Cody D. Berman. But no, man, I'm not going to ask for much. Um, I guess I'll put out one thing because I like putting out feelers because sometimes you don't know what the universe is going to give back. So something we didn't talk about is going to be in part two. Over the past two years, I've built an agency and now we help 
influencers and celebrities and other folks like that create courses and memberships. So if you're someone with a monster audience and you're like, I feel so under monetized and some of the stuff that Cody has been talking about in this podcast today sounds super cool. I'd love to learn backend and funnels and all that stuff. Hit me up, send me a DM on Instagram, but anyone else, if you're not that, that. please also come into my orbit, come hang out, come learn (laughs) stuff. I'm talking about investing real estate, digital products, all that good stuff. You can get all that stuff for free on Instagram, my podcast, pretty much everywhere online. Even if you're not a huge influencer, you can still reach out to Cody. I'm an example. <laughs> <laughs> Cody, man, I appreciate you. It's been a lot of fun. I can't say I have a date plan to go to Massachusetts, but <laughs> if we end up meeting somewhere else like Austin or uh, even Puerto Rico, you're pretty close to the Puerto Rico, so we might have to make that happen. I'm not too far. I would love to meet up, man. Yeah, that would be great. Looking forward to it. Let's make it happen. Cody, appreciate your time. Jesse Ray, Growth House Podcast. We're out.